Alléluia. I don't know if we remember this song. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, thy the glory, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, thy the glory, thy the glory, hallelujah. upon this assembly. We thank you for how you have begun to reveal yourself to us again. How you have been sending your word to us. Lord, even in direct utterance and in songs and in diverse ministrations as we have prayed. Father, again, we are looking up to you. Lord, you said it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. You said the bread is meant for us and we have come to receive more bread to yet feast at your table father feed us we pray in jesus name lord let it please you to again again encounter us in a manner that no one of us will be able to recover from let us encounter you. Let us engage you. Let us explore you. Let us be swallowed up in worship. Father, we thank you. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. And amen. Praise the Lord. We can be seated, please. I bless God for the theme of the convention. And I was excited in my heart as I heard our senior pastor begin to expound the issues of the theme Greater Works. Greater Works. You know, it's, it's one scripture that many people get to and you may wonder, maybe was Jesus very was he serious when he was saying this? <laughs> you know, but if you, if you read a lot of what Jesus said, you will see that you would actually have cause to wonder on so many occasions. And so, I would want us to go through the word of God together this evening. And I'm trusting that the spirit of God will take his word and he will make it to be life and that it will not just be letter in our hearts in the name of Jesus. As I looked again at this passage of scripture in John chapter 14, I actually saw that it did not start from John chapter 14 verse 1. Um, and if you look at it, you will see that it's from verse 13 
that it actually started. Because to open, to begin a discussion and say, let not your heart be troubled. Surely something must have been the basis of Jesus saying that. There must have been a, a consequence. There must have been something that initiated it. And if you read the last four or so verses of chapter 13, you will see this. You know, the thing we tend to see in, that, in those verses that has obscured the connection between that and the, uh, verse 14 is because Jesus told Peter in the very last verse when he said, look, you will deny me. So we look at it that, no, that is the problem. But you see, there was something that troubled Peter. There was a question that Peter asked that led to that. Jesus had been telling them how he was going to go away. He says, and where I am going to, you cannot, you can't come there. Just like I told the Jews. You cannot be there. And I can imagine that the disciples were perplexed. I can imagine that they were troubled. Ah, Jesus, we have left all to follow you. What, what do you mean by this? And of course, thank God for Bro Peter. You know, if others cannot speak, he will always do what? He will speak. The body in his heart, he asked him, Lord, whither goest thou? Where are you going? And why can I not follow you? And Jesus told him categorically, you can't follow me, but later on you want. So Peter first said, oh, no, 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 no. Wherever you are going, I will go. In fact, I will lay my life for you. Jesus' answer to reveal to Peter what he would do was a diversion. To explain to Peter, no, 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 this thing is not a matter of energy. The main issue that was troubling Peter still needed to be addressed. The main issue that was troubling the disciples that Peter voiced still needed to be addressed. And even now, there are many things that trouble our hearts. There are many things that ought not to, but they do trouble our hearts. And they make our hearts to be tossed up and down like the waves of the sea. We look that will happen when you look at the world system. When you look at this life. Jesus himself has already said also that in this world you will have what? You have tribulation. That is what he said and brethren he meant it. He meant it. There is nothing that is in this world that is not ephemeral. There is nothing. And so, when you are building the foundation of your life on something that is a sinking sand, you will have reason to be troubled. You will have reason to be troubled. The world keeps changing. They keep changing. Whatever they have told you today, there will be a change tomorrow. There will be something new. And so if all you can see is within time, if all your perspective and your horizon is contained in time, if you do not allow Jesus to raise your vision beyond time into the eternal, you will be troubled. But my brethren, I again want to repeat what already God has begun to tell us. Jesus said, if I may paraphrase it, if you actually believe in God, believe in me also. You know that that's a tremendous statement. It was in response to the trouble in their hearts. It was 
in response to the agitations. Yesterday, I was asking somebody, I said, do you think you believe in Jesus? And she said, yes. After all, she was sure she had given her life to Christ as a teenager. And now she was a married woman and had been quite active in church. And so she had no reason to think that she did not believe in Jesus. So I asked her a question. Because she was worried. She had, and I was trusting God for help to get beyond the facade, the front that was there, that I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. And so I said, if you are a Christian, then why this much worry? Why this much? And he said, I believe. I said, okay. Um, because the primary issue I could see was that she liked to have her way. And so I now asked her a question. I said, what are your goals? And she told me some of her goals. I said, very good. This particular goal you have, what if God tells you that he does not want you to work in this field of yours? This field, you have graduated, you are working now, you are in the pre preliminary stage of building a career, and God says, no, I don't want you to work in terms of on the secular field, what I want you to do is to be a full-time housewife, um, give full support to your husband, and uh, all of that. Ha, huh, she said. It's another goal she had was she just wanted two children. I said, was that your own conclusion or that of you and your husband? So well, she told the husband that if you want more than two, he has to go and have the third one. I said, very good. And I Step by step, I started pointing out that the fundamental issue is that she always wanted to have her way. And when you want to have your way, whenever you have a chosen goal, and that goal and that objective is blocked, we respond with resentment, we respond with anger, we respond with worry, we respond with agitation. Because we have set an objective and we are unable to get to that objective as it were. But it is important for us. I now, so when I now told her that, she now stopped and she thought back. I said, at least you never prayed about this two children issue. You never prayed about the possibility that God may want you to have four. I want you to have five. Because I asked, why do you want to have two? I said, it is not an issue with God whether you want to have one, two, three, four, five. The issue is, I just asked, what was the motive? So that she will have enough time for career. And I said, what about one? If you have only one child, you also have enough time. I said, okay, well, in case my husband wanted more than one, actually one is what I want. I said, yes. Even that one, why do you want to have that one? so that you can prove your fertility to other human beings. And once you are proven to every human being that you can also have a baby, it no longer matters. You have proven it. So if you didn't have a baby, would you not have been worried? She thought about it. She said, yes, she would have been worried. I said, yes, you would actually have been worried. But what would have worried you was not the purpose of God. It was not the counsel of God. It wasn't the glory of God. What would have worried you was simply the fact that you have not been able to prove to every other person that me too I can have a baby. It's still all about you. And my brethren, so long as it's all about you, your heart will be troubled. I want to tell you. So long as you remain the center of your universe, so long as you are the fulcrum and you want to employ God to accomplish your own works, you will be troubled. Peter wanted to follow Jesus in the energy, in his own energy. Jesus said, no, you, where I am going to, you can't come. Peter said, no, I can come. I can even lay down my life. And Jesus said, no, 
you not only will you not be able to lay down your actually you deny me trials. There seemed to be a blockade. A blockade. Peter could not get through. And the disciples do, did not because that was their own objective. They had not yet shifted. They had not yet ceased from their own works. They hadn't ceased from their works. And until you are ready to cease from your works, you are not ready to cease from worry and anxiety and ag agitation. You are not ready to enter into the works of God. And Jesus said a profound statement. He said, if you believe in God, believe also in what? In me. Thank God for those of us who believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Earlier this week, I love the statement that came out from the mouth of a young man, a young couple. I said, yes, it will indeed be to you according to your faith. He said, the amount of God's power that is needed to solve all of humanity's problems not only his own. He says it's just an infinitesimally small aspect of his power. When he said that, in my, my heart blessed him. He, 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 you know what he was saying? He's saying God does not need most of it. He doesn't need half. He doesn't need 25%. He doesn't need 10% of his power to solve all of humanity's problem. You know, sometimes when we look at the challenges befalling us, we think, oh God, you have to come with all your might to come and solve this problem. No. The reality is that all of humanity's problem doesn't need an infinitesimally small, just a small aspect of his power. Do you believe this? Jesus and Jesus is the embodiment of the Father. So when he was asking his disciples, telling his disciples, if you really believe in God, believe also in me. I want to re-paraphrase that. If you actually trust in the Father, trust in me also. If you actually trust in God, repose confidence in me also. In making those statements, Jesus was very categoric. He was declaring who he actually is. But I want to challenge you again as I challenged my sister yesterday. How much confidence do you think you actually repose in God? Looking at yourself superficially, you may think you actually trust God. As God helped us in that discussion, it became very clear to the sister how much she trusted. Because I said, okay, now that we've come to this point, and you are seeing that there's one problem first, and that is, you want to have your way. You have your own works that you have set before you. You have your own agenda that you want to do and that you believe will actually be the source of your fulfillment. That in doing of these works, you will find your security, your self-worth, and all of that, and your significance. And so when you don't do these things, you have problems. I said, that's one problem. You check again. If a little child is hungry, because I, I, I wanted it to be clear that she wasn't trusting God. If a little child is hungry and she goes to the kitchen, a four-year-old or five, 
and she moves around the house and he can't find anything. Even if there was something to eat gone, first he will go and meet daddy and mommy and say, I'm hungry. If there is no food in the kitchen, how much worrying do you think that child will worry? The child is not going to be worried about the presence or absence of food in the kitchen. The child is going to trouble the parents that I am hungry. Whether you are going to store food in that kitchen to meet, to satisfy my hunger, or whether you are going to bring it from outside every day that I need it, that is not the concern of that child. What that child is expecting is that you will meet his or her need. That is trust. That is faith. That is believing. We are talking of an expectancy that results in an assurance of heart. Why is your heart still troubled? If there is a genuine expectancy that has given you rest, if, there, if you have reposed in Jesus an expectancy, I say, well, if you will not provide for me, what it simply means is that it's your will that I should die of hunger. If you will not provide for me, then I will take it that it's your counsel that this thing should happen like this. Jesus said, if you believe in the Father, believe in me also. I want you to check those issues that are causing turbulence in your heart. Check it. And then put it beside. The, um, the, the, use it to measure. Use it to evaluate the trust you have reposed on the Father, on Jesus. And you will see that you don't actually trust him. Many people don't trust him. They don't. Praise the Lord. You know what is interesting about that passage of scripture? The next statement that Jesus made, again, if you engage it, it looks like a divergence from the issue that Jesus just began to discuss. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in the Father, believe in me also. The next is that he's saying, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, you look at that, and you are trying to look, is it heaven is talking about? You are telling me not to be troubled. And suddenly you are telling me of your father's house. Well, what, what was he saying? You know, it was interesting. As... I was preparing for this meeting and God was opening my eyes again to that scripture that I have read many times. And he said, read it again. Look at what Jesus was saying. He said, and I'm going to paraphrase it again as I understood it. In my father's house, there is room for you. There is space for you. There is, there, is, there is enough space. There is enough room. There is enough resource. There is enough. There is more than enough. If it were not so, I would not have raised your hope. I will not be telling you to be reassured. In my father's kingdom, in my father's domain, in my father's estate. There is enough. We are not managing there. It's not that the resources are so scant. And they cannot meet your need. So I changed in my paraphrase that I wrote. I wrote it like that. In my father's house, there are many. 
there are many rooms in my father's estate. There is plenty of space. There is enough and more than enough resources. We are not on a tight budget in my father's kingdom. I will go further so that you will see something. Because when we look at that scripture, we look at it only in terms of eternal. As I was studying it, I was surprised that I have read this scripture before and it never dawned on me like this. When Jesus finished making that statement, he went on. He says, and I go to prepare a place for you. So he first established the fact that his father's estate is not deficient. It's more than enough. There's enough room. There's enough resource. And not only is there enough resource, you know, there can be enough resource but you don't have access. You don't have a stake. You don't have a place. You don't have an inheritance in that place. And I saw Jesus going to say, look, there's no need for you to worry. In my father's house, there is enough for your need. Not, in fact, not first for your need. There's enough and more than enough. Then I am going to prepare your portion. I'm going to prepare a portion for you. Because in the Father's kingdom, the angels had had their inheritance. Others had had their portion. But we didn't meet any because Adam had fallen. We didn't meet any. Because Adam had fallen from his estate. And it looked as if we don't have we don't have a place. It looks as if we can only be beggarly. You remember that woman, the Syrophoenician woman that came with her child and Jesus said, it's not meat to give the bread of children to dogs. You know what that means. A dog does not have space. It doesn't have space in, in the house. It has space outside the house. It doesn't really have place in the house. In my father's house, there is enough. There are many rooms and to spare. And it's not just that. For you in particular, myself, I am the one who is going to prepare your portion. And I want you to reflect on the reality of the fact that Jesus is the one who is preparing a space for you in, your father's, in his father's kingdom. In our father's kingdom. It's tremendous. Because the Jesus we speak of is greater than all the angels. Go and look at all the angels that stand before the father. Those that sing, holy, 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 and they, are, they never see night or day. Those that their body is full of eyes. And those eyes, they still cover it because they dare not behold the Father on the throne. Different categories of angels that surround him. What space can you and I contain in the midst of such mighty resources? What space can we assay to lay hold of and say, this is where we too should belong. And this is what should flow unto us. And then perhaps we have to wait till heaven. It was interesting as I studied the passage. Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I must of necessity come and receive you so that where I am, you will be there also. Second time he was using the word also. He said, if you believe in the Father, believe in me also. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will of necessity come and receive you to be with me also. 
we have correctly ascribed that to the rapture, but it's not only the rapture. Open Ephesians chapter 2. From verse 5, 6, and 7. Yes. Even when we were dead in sins, had he quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. Go on. And had raised us up together. Now, that word raised us up. Did he say, and he will raise us up together? Is that what the Bible said? Did he say he will raise us up together? He had raised us up together and made us to do what? To sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Who are we sitting together with? Who are we sitting together with? Do we believe that that is the sphere, the position from which we are to operate? You know, a lot of times, Jesus, particularly that of um, Mary and Martha, when Lazarus died, the question he asked them comes to my mind. He said to Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha was saying, well, I know that my brother will rise again at the resurrection. And Jesus said, he that believeth in me, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that is alive, believing in me, shall never die. You know the final statement here? He said, believest thou this? Do you believe that what God has done, that Jesus coming back was not only, it's not only in the rapture, in the resurrection, when he resurrected from the dead, he came back through the Holy Spirit to ensure that we are seated together with him. Because except he comes, that we be with him also. We will still be preoccupied with our own works. We will not be able to enter the works that he has prepared for us to enter into from the foundation of the world. So I began to see that this scripture, it now made sense when Jesus was giving them assurance. Because if somebody is troubled and all you are telling him is that don't worry. Maybe in 20 years' time, after all this trouble we end, and you will come to heaven. You say, well, okay. So, uh, what you are saying is that I can still um, entertain the trouble, but I only need to endure because the trouble will finally finish. So, I still have a troubled heart until that time. I don't see that that's what Jesus is saying. Because it, otherwise, there is no coherence of thoughts. There's no coherence. The disciples were troubled now. And Jesus needed to tell them, there is a provision. I am going, but I am coming back. Not only at the rapture, we can also see the rapture there and it will be correct. Because that is the final cessation of all that has to do with this life, but even in this life. Jesus kept saying, I will come to you. I will come to you. And I see that that is what he is saying. And in the Holy Spirit, and by his war, he has come to us. So that, and you know what he wants to do? He does not want us to operate from where we are. You cannot operate from the position of your own works, of your own goal, of your own objective. He has to take you. 
He has to receive you. That is what he said in the third verse. He has to receive you. He will come and receive you so that where he is, you will be there also. And the problem for many of us is that when he wants to take us to where he is, that we might be there also, we tell him that where we are now, we are satisfied with it. Where we are now, we are content with it. Where we are now, we think the prospects associated with it is better than where he wants to receive us to. And when your heart is set like that, he can only be looking at you and you will yet be tossed by the waves of the sea of this life. Jesus said that where he is, you need to be there also. Praise the Lord. Even now, he said he has seated us. I know what's interesting. You can move to chapter 1 of that Ephesians. In chapter 1 of that Ephesians, you will see Jesus. Of course, through Apostle Paul talking. And he was talking of the position of Jesus. Um, I think it's the mid verse when he said, seated far above principalities and powers. And so that we will know where we are seated. Can we turn to Ephesians, please? Chapter 1, we've already read um, chapter 2. Yes. Chapter 1, you can read from 19, isn't it, to 23. It says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Look at that word again. Raised him from the dead. When you go to chapter 2 that we have read before, verse 6, and had raised us up. So he's not only talking of something that is futuristic. He has raised us where? Up. Don't stay down. When the father says, come up here, don't stay down. He has raised us up. The same way. He raised, he said he has raised Jesus from the dead. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above. It's not just above, but it's how far? It is far above. That word above is not only talking of hierarchical superiority, it's talking also of the, the gulf. You can imagine in all realms of glory, of authority, of power. Far above, far beyond the country chain. All principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world. Oh, oh. Praise the Lord. I want you to read that again. Not only where. Okay. So already in this world has Jesus been positioned above the governing authorities of this world. So I want us to answer. Has he been set above the ruling principalities of this world? He must be. Because the scripture is telling us if I, he went beyond, he says not just in this world. So that is already taken for granted. He's already been positioned. Sometimes we may think that the President of the United States is so powerful. We may think that the President of the the, 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 the ones, they, they call them the five P's that negotiated the, the deal with Iran. The U.S., France, the U.K., um, Germany, Japan, and maybe Russia. They are supposedly the power brokers, isn't it? 
and then the, maybe the United Nations. I remember a song by Terry Clark. He said, these foolish earthly powers parading their minds. They are not anywhere near the starry host of the heavens of one single night. I, I'm not singing. It's an old song. He, he, looked, he said, look, all, all these earthly powers, they are like toys. Our master is positioned far above them. I don't even want to talk of our own national earthly powers that we allow to trouble us. So he is above them, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his what? Is his body. So I want to ask, have you really become part of his body? Have you become part of his body? If you have become part of his body, do you now understand the premise in which he said in chapter 2, verse 6, that you are seated where? With him. Praise the Lord. And we are. We are. We, we if I may ask you again, you believest thou this? You know, a lot of times, Jesus will ask that question. The man who came to him, one of them who came to him for healing, he said, do you believe I can do this? Do you trust, do you have confidence in me that I am able to do this? My brethren, I want you to know that if you remain where you are, it's not God's fault. I want you to know that. And that should make you to go back and search. I want you to resolve clearly that God is free of blame. And since he is free of blame, and he, he is not somebody who is giving to double talk, he doesn't say one thing and mean another. The Bible said, has he said it? And will he not do it? One of the reasons Jesus could not do many mighty works in Galilee, that's also great works, was because they did not do what? They did not believe. They didn't repose confidence in him. And the Bible said, he could not do many works. Great works. He couldn't. Do, he couldn't. The issue was not that there wasn't a need for great works. The issue was not that there wasn't the capacity to do those great works. The issue was that there was no faith, no expectancy, no confidence reposed in Jesus that would translate the resource into a supply for the need. The need was there. The resource was there. The person who had the resource was willing but the need continue to remain there. I want you to resolve in your heart. Because these issues, they are personal matters. They are very personal. I want you to resolve that even, I don't yet know what it will, what it will take of me. But whatever it will take of me, to do all that God has ordained for me. Father, I believe that you, you yourself, you will do what? You will supply it in me. Praise the Lord. Because that which you have spoken concerning me, it is going to come to pass. That which your word has said, I am going to enter into it. Praise the Lord. And when Jesus said this, he expected of his disciples. And he said, look. And since I am going to the Father, 
and I'm going to prepare a place for you and receive you to myself. He concluded in verse 4. He said, and where I'm going, you know. And the way, you know. And of course, Thomas asked him the famous question. And Jesus gave the reply, which we have also begun to look at this evening. And it was striking to me that that passage, a lot of times when we look at it and say, Jesus replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We often look at it as if it applies only to salvation. So I was very, it was one of the reasons why I was excited as our senior pastor was talking about it. We see Jesus, okay, Jesus is the way for me to be born again. Jesus is the truth about life. And once I've come to the truth and I'm born again, and then he is the life and I have eternal life. It is true. It applies to the sinner. But my brethren, it also applies to the believer. To those who are following Jesus. And I do not mind repeating it. He is the way. He is the access. He is the truth. He is the essence. He is the life. He is the ultimate. And if you are in a particular position and you need to grow into a higher estate in your walk with God, in your relationship with the Father, Jesus is not only the way that brings you to salvation. Your need for spiritual growth, he is also the way. The person who embodies, who is the essence of all that you need to receive, to enter into a higher realm, into a higher walk. And when I'm talking of something higher, brethren, I'm telling you first and foremost, and most importantly, I'm not talking of higher in any earthly concept. I'm not. Because if you want to compete with the children of this world in their own in, in, in material things, I want to tell you that you will not be able to beat them. Because Jesus has already said, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if it were of this world, my servants would what? Tell my servants would fight. You, you won't be able to take hold of me. You would not. And so, if you measure yourself and evaluate yourself by this material world, you are likely to lose the focus. So, when I'm talking of growth, I'm talking of something higher. I, I, I want you to again check your heart. I want to challenge you. What's your expectancy? What is your, what's your, um, what is your hope? What's your expectation? Almost two weeks ago, somebody who, not more than two weeks ago, who, um, we, we, it's part of a team of people who join us when we do certain operations was troubled. Something that cost a lot 
was misplaced. And it was assumed that she brought it from Lagos to come and join us. And she fretted and forced. And okay, they felt maybe they left it. When they went back, they didn't find it. She came back again. So when she came back, and she came to my office. Now, she didn't know this, but she, she was tense. She's a young girl, just starting career path. And, and somehow, in my heart, I just got a witness to say, okay. I said, by latest Monday, we will find this thing. <laughs> when he first came to my heart, I said, Lord, I hope, <laughs> I hope I'm not speaking just because of the sympathy that I have for this person. Well, anyway, I told her. Because, you see, you, God will begin to help us. If it is so, so. If it's not so, I don't bother. So, I said this and I forgot. Until I saw her again today. And just don't know me. Because she was more relaxed. That thing you were looking for, did you find it? She said, yes. For me, the first thing I, was, I wanted to, I said, when did you find it? She said, she found it on Sunday. The Sunday before Monday. Do you know where they found it? They found it in Abelkuta. Somebody, another colleague of hers, had mistakenly put it into his own car, dropped the sister in Abelkuta. They brought it out of the vehicle. They didn't take it to the house. It was at the point where he dropped it and the thing remained there. And that thing cost millions. They found it intact and they took it back. When she told me in my heart, I said, okay, so yes, I, I, I heard what I heard correctly. You know, many things are happening and a lot of times we, we are looking only at material things. Can we take our eyes to eternal things? Can we look at those things that Jesus symbolizes? Can we seize from our own works? Can we enter into his own rest. Because it's only with him also and in him. Like we have been told that this greater works, that we have any hope of him by his spirit accomplishing them in us and through us. Praise the Lord. And you know, when I also looked at the issue of greater works, you want to ask, because Jesus first said something. He said, the works, if you believe, the works that I do, he said, you will do also. Then I asked myself, what were the works that Jesus did? You know, a lot of times, when we are also looking at those works, we are only looking at miracles. Praise the Lord. Um, those are part of the works, but I will tell you that the works that Jesus did was not per se the miracles. Okay, and let me present it to you. For 30 years, Jesus was on earth before he started ministry. Was he doing works? He was. What was he doing? He was doing that which the Father wanted him to do. And so, since for those 30 years, the Father didn't want him to do miracles, open miracles, at least as we know it, he did all that the Father wanted him to do. He lived the life of the Father. That was the work. You will remember in John 6, 29, when they asked Jesus, he said, what are the works of God that we might do them? 
And he said, this is the work of God. That you should believe in him. You should believe in him whom the father had sent. I want you to understand that when Jesus is first talking of works, what he's talking of is doing that which the father wants you to do. That is what is considered a work. Any other thing that you do, which the father doesn't want you to do, is a waste. It's a waste. Even if it seems as if there is an immediate result and you can look at something, it's a waste. And it now made sense to me when Jesus said, the works that I do, if you believe in me, you can do them also. If you repose confidence in me, just as I, you know, so let me first explain that. So when Jesus is walking along the road, if it's the Father's will for him to raise the dead, he is only doing that work in the context of the will of the Father. If it wasn't the Father's will for him to raise the dead, he will not, that was not the work that Jesus would do. Oh, we remember that Jesus raised the dead, he raised Lazarus, he raised the son of the widow of Nain, um, he raised Jairus' daughter. Do we think that it's only three people that died in Israel during the time of Jesus? Uh, no, we need to look, ask ourselves certain questions. It couldn't have been only three. Let's say he even raised some others. He did not raise every dead person because that was not the work that the father set before him. The ones that he raised were the ones that the father set before him. I want to remind you of another. There was a man that was sitting at the gate, beautiful, that Peter and John raised later, uh, healed later on. You think Jesus didn't pass that spot? Because that man had been there before. Jesus passed that spot and he went to the one that was sitting in the pool of Beth Bethsaida and he healed that one and he left the other one. Because the issue, when it comes to this issue of works, it's not about you. It's not about what you want to do. It's about what he wants done. And we need to get this focus. We need to get this direction. If we must cease from what? From our own works. We must seize from our own goals, from our own ambitions. And we must look to him and say, like Paul, what will you have me to do? And as we ask him the question, we also believe. We're not just asking, what will you have me to do? We believe that he is able to make us to do that which he wants us to do. Because a lot of times that's what may trouble your heart. It may trouble your heart and say, oh, how am I going to do this thing that the Father wants me to do? Oh, no, no, no. There is no need to be troubled. Either, even by those things which the Father wants you to do. If you have left the earthly realm, and you are looking at the spiritual and say, oh, oh, the father may want me to do this. The father may, no, no, no. The first thing the father wants you, repose confidence in him. In Jesus. He is able to make you. He is able to capacitate you. He is able to enable you. He is able, he, he has made room. He has gone. He has prepared a place for you. So you have a standing before God. You have a local standee before the Almighty. You have a portion and an inheritance. And that's why he has given the Holy Spirit. Don't measure yourself and short measure yourself by material evaluation. Don't do that. And as we realize that what is most important is the works of the Father. What he wants done.
you will cease from labors, from setting so many goals. You could say, okay, maybe as I'm going, Lord, I would love to do this and do this and do this. If it's your will, I present them to you. And as you are going, as he supplies the grace, you do it. If you get to a point and you say, oh Lord, I would have this done. But not as I will, as you will. Is that your will? I, you will cease from struggle. And as we cease from struggling, we will find out that something happens. You see, these greater works, Jesus now said, he said, and greater works than these shall you do. And he said something. He said, because I go unto my father. Again, I was very glad as we saw that in the embodiment of the overall volume of works that the church will do. And that is very true. Because we are many and Jesus was one, we will do greater works. But something also dawned on me. You see, if you carry a white cloth. Huh? A white cloth. And you um, so to say you stain it. You stain it. You stain it. You know that the background of that cloth is naturally white, isn't it? And so if you wash it with what is strong enough, it will be clean, isn't it? It can go back to what it is originally. We know that Jesus was sinless. It was our sin that, so to say, stained him, that the Father put on him. He didn't have any original sin. But if you have a pink dress or a purple dress, and you want to make that purple dress to become white, now, that purple dress was also stained. Terrible st terribly stained. Even when you finish washing it, are you going to get white? At best, what you will get, is it not purple? If you are going to transform it, not only from the dirt, and you are going to make it white, which one have you translated in a greater measure? The purple one. Jesus came he is the son of God. You know, a lot of times we look at him as if, yes, he stripped himself of his powers. But he was sinless. But that's not the background from which you and I are coming. But you know the promise he still holds us. He is still saying that because I go to the father, you will do greater works. And one of those greater works I saw was that in one of the, in fact, I, I think the greatest miracle, the greatest miracle in existence is not raising of a dead man. If you raise a dead human being, he comes back to his natural life. No, the greatest miracle is to be able to see a dog and make that dog to be another animal without passing through the portals of death. You don't understand what I'm saying. You know human beings believe in, some human beings believe in reincarnation. In other words, they are saying that the only way you, if you, if you first lived as a servant or as a dog, if you, were, if you come in another life, you become a human being. Isn't it? Those people believe in it. It's not true. Because they can't see how the nature of a being that is now can currently can change into something else whilst his body remains. We do not appreciate the magnitude of God's power in translating a sinner, in transforming a sinner, in transforming his character and his life and the nature in him from that of a sinner to that which is of Christ. We underestimate it. We belittle it. There's nothing greater than that. 
If you raise a dead man, you only make him a human being again. That's why Lazarus eventually died. That's why Jairus' daughter eventually died. But when you raise, when what is inside us is terminated and the body doesn't die, and another life inhabits the same body, brethren, a power has worked there that can only belong to the Almighty. And what Jesus is saying, not only was the Father's nature, his own life, better than us, for as many as have truly encountered him, he also nurtures us to become like him. So, any work that his life in us does, because the starting point from where he has raised us is so horrible, almost automatically you can regard it as a greater work. If a five-year-old solves a complex calculus and a professor of mathematics solves it, of the two of them, who, who did the greater work? It's the five-year-old. It's the five-year-old. And I want us to see what Jesus has in store for us. We need to believe. We need to trust. I will not want to keep us longer. I want us to begin to prepare our hearts to pray because there's a lot still left. When uh, I, I, I just thank you, sir, for the opportunity to look at this scripture again. I was, I was amazed because I, I would have thought, I can literally follow the verse by verse by verse before. But when I sat down, I said, let me look at this scripture again. It was like a scripture I had never read. And I want us, because critical to what the Father wants to do is that he wants us to repose confidence in him. Jesus wants us to repose confidence in him. And to the extent where you are ready to, you are not going to strive, you are not going to you are simply going to rest secure in him and say, Jesus, that which you would have me to do, I will do it. By your spirit in me, not even myself. Anything else, I didn't see Jesus struggling. And so I'm not going to struggle. I will leave it to you. If it's your will, you will do it in me. You will do it through me. I will see it manifest. And if it is not, I will rest in you and rejoice. I will believe you and I will trust you. I will pray. I will give thanks. And that is one very important measure of faith. When you receive something that you have been expecting, what normally happens? You give thanks. Is it not? If Nepal takes light now, and the light comes back. Reflexly, we all say what? Thank God. We just say, oh, ah, thank God, Nepal is back. You know what that means? When you truly have assurance of your expectation, thanksgiving will abound from your heart spontaneously. If your expectancy has led, has resulted in an assurance of hearts and a rest. One important measure of it is thanksgiving and praise. Because, as it were, you have already received even that which you did what? Which you believed for. And so, if rather what has been in your heart is grumbling and complaining and murmuring, and fear and anxiety. I want us as we pray now. Let's rise on our feet. I want you to say, Father. I. Even if it's just the honesty of what that man told him. I said, he said, I believe. Help my own belief. I want you to tell him. 
heart to heart and say, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. The extent to which I have not reposed confidence in you. The areas in which, because I have not actually reposed confidence. I have been agitated. I have been worried. I have been tense. I have been fearful. I have complained. I have grumbled, murmured. Lord, all of that. Let them come to an end. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse me from that. Lord, I believe. And I come to you this evening. Lord, I see that the package you have for me is so much more than I could ever hope for. Lord, I, I am willing to enter in. Cause me to enter in. You are able to do all things. Lord, enable me. Quicken me, I ask in the name of Jesus. I am believing you. That you who have brought me and has made me to sit down. Even before I was born, you knew I would sit down at some point and hear a message like this. Lord, let that word, even having arranged it and brought me to this point. Lord, help me to enter into these provisions. Help me to enter into the provisions that you have made for me. You said, what you said is that I am seated with you. You have raised me from the dead. And I am seated with you in heavenly places, in Christ, far above. This is not a lie. You don't tell lies. You are not trying to tease me. You are not trying to make mockery of me. That is not you. You are not a man that you should lie. Neither the son of man that you should repent. You are not double-tongued. You are not a crook. You are not cunning. Surely you can be trusted. Lord, help my heart. Whatever veil that has, has, been, has not been making me to see you, to trust you, to repose confidence in you as I ought to, to find my rest in you. Lord, take such veils away. Lord, take such veils away. Lord Jesus, take such veils away because I ask in the name of Jesus and in all of this discourse, one of the things you said is that I should ask in your name and that you will do it. I ask for this. I ask for this, Lord, so that the portion that you have prepared for me, you say that if you go away and you prepare, if you are going to prepare a place for me, if you have gone and you have prepared a portion for me, you must of necessity come back and receive me so that where you are, I will be also. And because of that, you said, I will not leave you comfortless. That was what you said in John 15, 16. You said, I will come to you. That is what you said. And you have fulfilled it. You have come to me. Lord, let me not ignore you. Let me not neglect you. Let me not set you aside. Have you come to me? Let me submit to you so that you can receive me even to be where you are also. Oh, Father, we thank you. Blessed be your holy name. Father, we thank you. Lord, we pray that because it is your counsel, because it is your will, because it is your purpose in Christ Jesus, let there be an outpouring of your spirit afresh on your people, upon every one of us. Let there be a quickening. Let there be an opening of our eyes of understanding. Let there be an uplifting. Lord, let there be a breaking down of yokes. Let there be a breaking down of oppression, of bondage in the name of Jesus. Let the resurrection power accomplish in us what no earthly power can accomplish. And let us enter into the fullness of your provision in worship, in joy, in rejoicing, in prevailing over the elements of the earth, in doing your will all day long. Thank you, Father.